Thank you very much, uh, Björn. Warm uh, welcome, Helen MacDonald, to the Global Square, where we discuss global issues and global challenges. Warm yes. welcome to you. Uh, it's lovely to be here. Thank you for this. Thank you, for everyone, for coming. We will now discuss uh, a little bit more in depth uh, your latest book. Um, it's a collection of essays, one could say? It is, and it's really funny. You know, the word essay used to terrify me. I was the kind of child at school who never did their homework. Oh. <laughs> so when I discovered the essay form later in my life, I, I was like, oh, it's, it's wonderful. You know, they're very sort of generous. They're like puzzles I'm working out with a reader about some aspects of the natural world and our relationship to it. I really love these, this form. Because it's all also like prismas. Uh, I was. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah th well, thank you. Because I was figuring out what, what form is it. Because I also get a little bit intimidated by the word essay. It sounds a little bit scholarly. Mm. But this one is more. Yeah, it, it, it's like dro teardrops or something that comes after another and they form this uh, universe. Oh, that's lovely. Thank I am you. so thankful after reading this book, but it was a challenge for me to read it because I started crying like oh, no. intensely. Yeah. No, oh, no. no. So, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I was, it was sorry. Emotional to, no, but to it, write. it was su super emotional and I was trying to figure out why. Because it's not that you're working on, on any kind of... Um, you're not trying to lure the reader into some kind of sentimental universe. No. But y you are guiding us towards something that is existentially human nature. Yeah. Which is so profound and which is something that we have become disconnected from and and the only from from my personal experience the only connection we have with it is is our memories of being a child and being out in nature and exploring and having this fascination for the smaller bugs and the things flying and you feel like you're a part of this magical universe and yeah. that is what you create in this book can you tell me a little bit about your mission and vision and, and why you have yeah. written it and how it came to be this universe of teardrops? Wonderful. Well, that's, I don't know, I'm, I'm really moved by that. Thank you very much. So um, I think one of the things you just said really chimes with me, and that is that uh, in the modern West, our relationship with nature has become increasingly one of distance. So the ways we are allowed to interact with it are very, very small. It's, um, you know, we... It's like we look at it through a glass window. We're not allowed to touch it. You know, it's something too precious and always, it's always disappearing and always uh, endangered. And the problem with that is that I think it, it takes away a lot of the things that attach us to the natural world. So bonds of love. This is a book about love and paying attention. And when I was very small, I, I had a twin brother who died just after he was born, and I think partly that was what spurred me as a child to go looking for life, for community, for companionship in the natural world. And I laugh now because I'm sure that the snakes and the, the bugs I caught weren't really interested in, in being friends with me, but I was obsessed with learning what they were and their place in the world. And also they, they gave me as a child this magical ability to understand something that has always, again, chimed with me. And that is that we live in this very human scale. Um, as a child, your world is classrooms and bedrooms and maybe the, the field around the back of the house. But I used to lie in the ground when I was a child and look into the grass stems and see tiny insects, the sort of size of punctuation marks wandering around. And then I'd look up and look into the sky and I would see these you know, vast clouds like mountains passing overhead. And I think that was the first time I realized that the world is not just a human place. It's, it's, it's an incredibly complicated and complex wonder of different worlds all kind of uh, meshing with each other. And that wonder and curiosity is what spurred me to be a naturalist and to write this book. I, I'm pointing at a time of great environmental disaster and saying, look what's there. It's astonishment. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking also on a, on a more structural level. If we are in this, this, this uh, Anthropocene, I want to change mics with you okay. because mine is much better. Oh, so I hear okay. It might be my voice. No, no. Hello. Yeah, oh. Now it's much better for you. Yeah, I thank sound you. like the BBC Yes, because we want to listen to you. But... Um, <laughs> 
Uh, exactly, that was what, what I was th thinking regarding the, the sort of structure level of your message in the book, that we are in this Anthropocene and we are the center of something that is going to, it, it's broken and we need to fix it. And the, the remedy and, and, and the sort of cure and, and the possibilities for us to heal as humanity is also centered in our, con possibly yeah. our, our possibility to connect to nature. Mm. So in a, in a more yeah, political sense, Absolutely. one might, might read your book as, as some kind of pamphlet. In, it in is, that it's quite political. Direction. I'm, I'm not a very good campaigning writer. There are very many writers who will, you know, you open the book and you feel like you're being yelled at, you know, I, and I'm very bad at that. I don't like being told what to do. If you ever meet my mother, she will confirm this. You know, I, I, I always do the opposite. But what I think I like to do is to, is to just um, bear witness to what is still there and what we still have. And in terms of our relationship to the natural world, um, I like to think of there's a wonderful indigenous American writer called Robin Wall Kimmerer. And she asked this wonderful question, what would it be like to feel that the earth loved us back? Which is an astonishing question to meditate on. We're so used to expecting that we are always the destroyer. And she talks about building a sense in which that we have reciprocal relationship with the natural world. It's not just one way. She's a great, great writer. So one of the things I talk about a lot in this book, and that comes from my past as a historian of science, back when I was an academic and not a writer, um, is I'm fascinated by the ways in which we use nature as a mirror of our own social understandings of the world. Um, and that's what makes us value some animals and some landscapes more than others. So I think it's really important to try and uncover why we think some animals are horrible and one why we think some are really amazing. They, these questions seem to be not only about us, but about the ways in which we have to think about preserving the world around us. A lot of your attention is also directed towards the sky and, and to those creatures <laughs> uh, yes. who, who fills up the sky uh, in different patterns and shapes. And your connectedness in a more or less spiritual level, I would say, to birds yeah. is visible also in, in your uh, previous book, but the, uh, also in this book. Can you tell us a little bit more about your relationship to birds? Yes. When I was a child, all my friends had photographs and posters of pop stars on their walls, and I had pictures of birds. I was very strange. So for me, they mean many, many things. And one of them, when I was a child, was a way of escaping. I was a very solitary, quite a lonely child. And I used to watch birds uh, through binoculars a lot, and I discovered this magic trick. And it's a magic trick that the philosopher Iris Murdoch describes in one of her books, and she calls it unselfing. She says, when you are feeling sad or the world is very difficult, if you look out of the window and you see maybe a, a kestrel, a hawk hovering, if you concentrate on it really hard, you sort of feel, she uses this wonderful phrase, that the world becomes all kestrel. You become this sort of, this act of imaginative empathy with this animal. And then when you come back to yourself, magically your own sense of misery and sadness has lessened. And this is what I did as a child. I, I used to watch birds and pretend I was a bird. Um, so that was really early on. And, but they are also such great symbols of transcendence and, and, and flight and all these sort of human metaphors and meanings that are ir irresistibly pulled towards them. One of the stories that struck me the deepest is the one with the boy and, and the parrot, actually. Oh. It was so... I don't know, I was caught off guard in some sense. And now you, when you explain this, it, it makes more sense why, why it struck me so, so hard. And, and um, for those of you who haven't, haven't read this book yet, you're in for a treat. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about um, like how, how has the perception of the book been and how, what, are you, what, what is your sort of work around uh, going out. Yeah, I know you're on tour now and, you, and the, the book will be published in many countries. So what do you look forward to most and, and what are the challenges in, in releasing the book out into the world? 
Um, that's a really good question, which I need to quickly think about. Um, so one of the things that obviously the pandemic and lockdown has done for me is it's completely changed the way that I was working with nature and that this book is full of essays that range from climbing the Empire State Building at night to watch birds and being in Australia and watching animals there. And, there's a, and all these places were on tour with my last book. I, went to, I traveled a lot and it was this extraordinary experience to discover nature everywhere. And then lockdown happened and I'm sitting in my house for three years and I started to think about how the natural world, we're always led to believe that in order to experience nature, we have to travel far to remote places, to woods and mountains, you know, this romantic sense. And I started to think about how full of privilege that was. What if you live in, a, in an inner city apartment and you, can't, you don't have money to travel to a mountain? You know, what, what happens? How do you relate to nature? And I had this moment of an epiphany in my house when I was, um, sorry, it's not really answering your question, but I need to it's say okay, this. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> so I, I'm a terrible housekeeper. Oh. And I had the spider, there was a spider above my oven on the wall and she had a, sort of her baby, you know, her egg sack there and she was protecting it. And I suddenly thought, look at that spider. This house belongs to her as much as me. What is this house like to her? How much of it can she see? What is she experiencing there in that corner of my wall? Is she even thinking? What, you know, how do her eyes work? What can she sense with her feet on the wall? And I had that moment where it was a sudden realization that we don't have to travel anywhere to have these experiences of the natural, to these encounters with wildness that teach us this lesson that the world is not just here for us. And that was a really important part of what lockdown did for me. I mean, it was a very dark and miserable and lonely time, but it, it made me realize I, I keep thinking it's a little bit like the, the monks in medieval monasteries who used to sit in one place and watch the stars turn and write about the weather. You don't need to leave. You can stay where you are and see the world around you. And so I think that that's made touring a very strange thing for me. It's a very old thing I'm doing, but somehow I feel much more rooted in, in local place now than I used to. It was, uh, you're now practice, practicing mind reading because it was a little bit what I was aiming for when I was, I, I, I thought we'd, we'd start talking about practicalities and what yeah. we do when we, how we live our lives, but what we need to do for the transition and how we need to shift our mindset and, yeah. and find new ways of yes. traveling as, as in this example and, and to, find, to, to find the world within in a much more sincere way than we have done during the era of capitalism and the era yes. of patriarchy and whatnot, like the, the, the more violent approach to, towards nature that we now need to, to shift to something new. Uh, you also mentioned a little bit in the book the closeness to the magical, re I, I wouldn't say magical realism, but I would say magic rather, <laughs> and, and what's in uh, nature. Yes. Can, can you um, Yes, I was very scared to write about this actually, because you know, um, I was a historian of science. I always thought myself a very rational person. And we are taught that the, the only correct way to really interact with nature is really a scientific level. And of course, you know, hard science is unbelievably important. We need, we need that quantitative understanding of the world, the theories, the, you know, the analytical frameworks to understand what's happening and how we can deal with the, you know, with the biodiversity disaster that's happening. But I think also, you know, there is a whole suite of ways in which nature is important to us that are routinely disregarded. And for me, those things are spiritual. When I wrote my last book, I kept trying to find the right language to talk about particular experiences that I had in the natural world. And I I ended up going to all these 19th century books on the sublime, and, but it wasn't quite right. And it was only later I discovered that the books that had all the right words for what I was feeling were books on theology. And I'm like, oh, because I don't have faith, but you know, there are experiences in nature which to me, they can stop time and they can make everything, they can change your life. Uh, certain encounters, certain experiences of weather. And so those moments to me, there's moments of grace are, secular, but I think those deep emotional connections to nature, I think if we can experience them as things that are 
not to be looked down on, but can actually inspire and um, create real energy for environmental activism. I think it's really important. And this is so interesting because this is something I also hear uh, that comes back in, in the healing process of the post-colonial era. And, and we have the focus country here, South Africa, and, yeah. and me, myself, I work a lot with that uh, part of the world. And, and many of the eco-feminists and, and those people who are uh, trying to address this, this colonial trauma and how to heal from that and how to find new ways of life are also very in, intrigued and interested in and trying to find those spiritual paths yes. and also to connect our spirituality to our bodies rather yes. than to, to, to traditions of religion or, or faith or, or different uh, patterns that in itself can be rather hierarchical or patriarchy or, or whatever they are, what not, systems that we have subordinated ourselves No, absolutely, ourselves and I think to. what's important with that also, I mean, to go back to the nature system, you know, one of the things that's really, you know, I only discovered later in life is that, you know, you look at nature and you think, oh, there's no human meaning in nature, it's nature. But then, you know, you start to realize the extraordinary colonial legacy of how we interact with nature. We, you know, we label it. A lot of the most important, like Darwin, a lot of those, those um, early right the way through the, nine, you know, up to the sort of 20th century, those, those um, explorations to detail and uh, to catalog the natural world, they all had uh, an imperial um, uh, meaning. That's why they were being done. So, and I think again about this notion of invasive animals, you know, some, some invasive animals don't really do much bad things to the environment, but there is a sense in which, you know, we don't want these animals here. They come from elsewhere. And you can see that's just a straight projection of, human social xenophobia onto the natural world. You know, it's much more complicated than that. So the way I think about the situation we're in now, sorry, I'm just talking now. I've had so much oh, coffee yeah. and I'm really excited <laughs> to talk. Um, we're, in, we're living in a really, really frightening time, as you know. Um, we're living through the sixth great extinction. You know, the climate change is terrifying. The way I think about it is, in, is now is in terms of thinking of it as an apocalypse, but not, not apocalypse in the sense that we normally use the word. So it, it's, its earliest meaning meant not just the end of things, but the revelation of things that have always been there that we've only just been given to be able to understand or see. And I, I just think that right now, there's a sort of sense in which no matter how hard the sort of structures of late capitalism are fighting it, people are really now, we, you know, no, we need to do something now. And we need to raise our voices against um, those vested interests and, and make a difference. Sorry, I had a little speech there. I said I wasn't very good at... I'm so thankful <laughs> that you did. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, and that, that is actually our... Oh, I mean, no. we, we, we can't go on anymore because this is such a short it seminar. Is. It's only 20 minutes. Okay. But for those of you who had the opportunity now to listen to, uh, to Helen and, and uh, you have the book uh, to, to look forward to, I hope you got inspired and got some sense of and this... I can I Amazing universe well. that, that, yeah. that you will uh, you. offer us. Yes. Thank you so much. And she will, uh, as I said, uh, also sell books and sign books over there in the corner or somewhere. I don't know uh, where the, where the s book selling is. Yes. Okay. Yes. You are a star. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank Have you a lovely day. so much, everyone. Thank you for coming. Oh. <laughs>